Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. Earth to Mars in two weeks? Earth to Saturn in one year? Earth to Alpha Centauri in 11 years? This is all science fiction, right? I mean, we're talking about fusion propulsion here, the power source that's always 20 years away. How the hell are we going to be doing an orbital demonstration of fusion propulsion by 2027? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. Again, a special bulletin coming at you. I wasn't really intending to put something out today, but the news just keeps coming fast and furious. We've had a lot of recent updates coming to us from Pulsar Fusion. Those of you who have seen the previous video, well, we've got some new information for you. But first of all, let me please urge you to check out To The Future. I just did my a second guest appearance on that channel talking about a topic that really makes me angry. I think you'd enjoy it. Link to this particular channel is in the description. Please like and subscribe to them. And as far as my tour is concerned, again, I have now raised the necessary funds for the first destination, that is to say Orlando. From there, it's going to be Pittsburgh, it's going to be Cincinnati, Toronto, then these are the dates that I have uh, confirmed thus far places where I've managed to secure some help to get me uh, a venue, also Denver, also Los Angeles, also Flagstaff, Arizona, um, and possibly Seattle and Salt Lake City as well. So as these dates continue to pile up, I, of course, am looking for a little bit of support in order to reduce the cost of the ticket prices and also to make sure that I don't bankrupt myself after the first two visits. Want to make sure that I can at least support my transportation and hotel expenses. I'll cover the venue. And by the way, for every $10 that's donated on my GoFundMe page, you get a ticket and also a free digital copy copy of my book that's going to be accompanying this tour and the theme, as I said before, is how Starship will save the world. Okay, back to the topic at hand. Pulsar Fusion has been a topic on my channel for almost a year now. Some people ask, why am I moving to the UK? Why, uh, especially Milton Keynes? Well, there are many, many reasons, but one of those reasons is the fact that Pulsar Fusion's headquarters is in Milton Keynes, and I have an open invitation to visit them regularly and cover all of their testing, all of their development, everything that they're going to be doing over the course of the next four years as they try to get a direct fusion propulsion system into operation and make an orbital test in 2027. But how is this possible? How can it be that fusion propulsion, fusion being the power source that's always 10 or 20 years away and go ahead and wait 20 years and then reset on that estimate. How can they possibly make this work by 2027? One of the most important reasons is the fact that you don't need fusion power in order to get fusion propulsion. Okay, let's take this process step by step, at least as how Pulsar Fusion sees it in the more distant future when it's a fully operational system. The Pulsar propulsion system is comprised of three different elements. All of these elements, by the way, have to be launched into orbit utilizing conventional chemical rockets, which, by the way, Pulsar Fusion also builds. They incidentally take care of all of the steps in this process. Once you're through with the chemical rockets, you use ion engines in order to maneuver all the different components of your fusion propulsion system into place once you've achieved low Earth orbit, and they build ion engines as well. So once the three components are completely assembled, this includes the payload fairing, the engines, and the fusion power system, then you're ready to go. Okay, that sounds really simplistic, so how does it really work? 
Well, first of all, as I said before, Pulsar Fusion doesn't rely on fusion power in order to make all of this work. They instead rely on fission power to provide the initial energy, and that energy is dedicated towards the creation of high-energy plasma. So the idea is to plug a lot of energy into a vacuum chamber in order to create this high energy plasma and you contain the plasma by means of electromagnetic field coils. So they have the vacuum chambers already at Pulsar Fusion's facilities. I got to see a smaller one when I toured them the last time and now they have a much bigger one in operation. Once you have the high energy plasma created and once it is contained via electromagnet it becomes its own self-sustaining fuel source. That is to say, the plasma itself is ionized and can be accelerated out the nozzle of a rocket at extremely high velocities. And at the same time, it also generates a tremendous amount of heat, which can be converted into electrical power to power the rest of the ship at the same time. But wait a minute, what makes this engine any different than any other type of plasma ion engine that we use today. If you aren't familiar with those, by the way, the idea is to ionize a propellant that can be easily ionized, that is, for example, an element like krypton, and then once it's ionized, you use electromagnetic power to accelerate the ionized particles out the nozzle in order to generate thrust. This is the sort of thing we use on satellites all the time, and the more power you plug into the system, the faster you can get the propellant to go. Well, the difference is a direct fusion solution doesn't use an ionized element like krypton, but rather bonds deuterium and helium-3 in order to create an ionized and energized propellant that's already traveling at a high speed. Now, if we want to compare the speeds of the propellant, in your average ion engine, you're getting anywhere from 20 to 40 kilometers per second. In a direct fusion engine, you're getting anywhere from 110 to 350 kilometers per second. And incidentally, the speed of a conventional chemical reaction is only four and a half kilometers per second. So you're looking at a difference of 110 kilometers per second to 350 as opposed to 4.5. The restriction that ion engines have had in the past is because they don't get enough electrical power in order to create enough ionized plasma to produce an appreciable thrust. Most ion engines on your average satellite generate only enough thrust to give you about the equivalent of the weight of an average sheet of paper. You need a lot more power going into a plasma engine in order to get an appreciable amount of thrust. So there's two ways of doing it. Number one, you can plug a nuclear reactor into a conventional ion engine, but even then, you're only getting about 20 to 40 kilometers per second out of your fuel, or you use that same nuclear reactor to create a fusion reactor reaction which generates ionized plasma that gives you anywhere from 10 to 15 times the performance of your average ion engine. So once again, you're looking at four and a half kilometers per second for a chemical rocket or with a direct fusion drive, you're getting the same thrust, but with 110 to 350 kilometers per second, therefore giving you 25 times more efficiency at minimum. So with the same amount of fuel that it takes to get to Mars in six months, you can get to Mars using a direct fusion drive in only 12 days. Now the problems that fusion reactors have had in the past and continue to have today is it requires at least as much energy to create the ionized plasma as you get back out of it in the form of heat energy. Therefore, you're not getting a positive power balance out of the reaction. But in this case, you don't have to get that. All you have to do is create the plasma, and then the plasma generates the thrust on its own because it's both ionized and high velocity and easily controlled by electromagnets. That is a huge difference. You don't have to wait for fusion power to become efficient in order for this solution to work. As a matter of fact, if Pulsar Fusion had the necessary funding and equipment at their disposal right now, they could probably put this solution 
turned into orbit next year and not 2027. But at the moment, they're going to be creating laboratory tests in Milton Keynes inside their new vacuum chambers in order to demonstrate how they can create this ionized plasma efficiently and safely before trying to put this into orbit. And by the way, the reason I'm continuing to show you this demonstration of an argon thruster, which is another type of ion engine that uses argon instead of krypton, is because Pulsar Fusion builds these as well, and they also build conventional rocket engines, both hybrid and liquid hydrogen engines. And the reason they're doing this is to generate the necessary amount of revenue and pick up the necessary number of clients to keep this project going with direct fusion. So it's a really good business model on top of everything else. And this is why Pulsar Fusion has picked up some very powerful partners as of late. Princeton Satellite Systems out of Plainsboro, New Jersey, have been working on a direct fusion drive for quite some time as well, and they've been sufficiently impressed with Pulsar to partner up with them in order to create a functional orbital test model by 2027. One of the biggest challenges of this type of engine is trying to control the plasma in the first place. This stuff is hotter than the sun. Absolutely nothing can contain it except for electromagnetic force. And of course, the only way that that can contain it is if it's ionized in the first place. So now that Pulsar is starting to create this plasma on a small scale in their laboratories in Milton Keynes, they're utilizing Princeton supercomputer capabilities in order to predict the behavior of the plasma so that they'll be able to control it a little bit better. Losing control control of this stuff would be absolutely cataclysmic. In addition, the UK Space Agency is also providing considerable funding to back not only Pulsar Fusion's main project, but also their Hall Effect thrusters. That is to say, their smaller ion engines that are going to be used on satellites. And another reason why the UK is an ideal place for this kind of technology to be developed is because Rolls-Royce is working on a nuclear thermal engine that's supposed to be demonstrated by 2027 or 2028 as well. Nuclear thermal engines superheat hydrogen fuel in large quantities and drive that out the nozzle, but only at about 10 kilometers per second. If Pulsar can demonstrate that they can achieve much higher higher efficiency utilizing the same power plant that Rolls-Royce is using for their nuclear thermal engine, that it's very possible that the UK is going to graduate directly to fusion power as opposed to nuclear thermal power to drive them to the planets and later to the stars. So the test engine that Pulsar is planning to launch into orbit is only a few meters long. It's comprised of a vacuum chamber, electromagnetic field coils, a nozzle for the rocket, and also a power source. And all of that can be delivered into orbit by a conventional rocket, perhaps a Falcon 9, a Vulcan Centaur, an Ariane 6, rockets that we have at our disposal right now. And if this works as planned, then the sky is no longer the limit. Limit. Let me describe how the mature version of this system would be deployed then. And let's go ahead and use Starship because, of course, that has the biggest payload and the biggest fairing size. In order to deploy a complete Pulsar interplanetary ship, you would need three Starships. One to carry the engine, one to carry the fairing, and one to carry the fusion reactor. Once these three rockets reach orbit, then the process begins of assembling the entire ship. You utilize ion engines in order to do your maneuvering in low Earth orbit because conventional ion engines are far more efficient than chemical rockets. Then once you have the ship assembled, the fusion reaction begins, the plasma is created, and the electromagnetic field coils drive the propellant out the back of the rocket at anywhere from 110 to 350 kilometers per second and off you go. The heat generated by the reaction also provides power for the ship, and you just decelerate by turning the ship around and applying thrust in the opposite direction. But there is one big problem to this overall solution to all of our interplanetary flight needs, and that is the need for helium-3. Helium-3 is an incredibly rare element on our planet. 
It's very common on the moon, but it's very rare here, and helium-3 combined with deuterium provides the most efficient and safest kind of fusion reaction, which means in order to get enough helium-3 to affordably fuel large-scale direct fusion drives, you're going to have to mine the moon. But there are many, many benefits to doing this. Helium-3 is also going to provide our best path to getting an efficient and power positive fusion reaction in the future. If we want fusion to become the revolutionary power source that we really think it could be in the future, helium-3 is going to be our best path to getting there. And helium-3 is much more accessible on the moon than any place else, which means there are many reasons why we need to go to the moon. So many valuable elements that we can exploit on the lunar surface, and perhaps the the most valuable of all of these is going to be helium-3. So what's next for Pulsar? Well, it's going to be some laboratory testing trying to demonstrate how efficiently they can control this high-energy plasma they're going to be creating, creating miniature suns inside their laboratory in Milton Keynes. And the best part? Well, for me, anyway, I'm going to be able to see a lot of this stuff in person. I'm going to be able to report on it and bring it to you as it happens. I can't wait to do that, so please stay tuned, please like, Please subscribe, please check the description for various ways to support this content, and as always, stay angry about space.